All right. Hello, everyone. You can see the uh, attendee number is starting to go up, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Beyond Criminality, Challenging Anti-Immigrant Narratives in Film and TV. Uh, this is an event in partnership with Storyline Partners and Define American. My name is Dustin Fleischman. I'm the Director of Events and Communications here at the Writers Guild Foundation. I'll try to keep things brief since, first of all, I'm just as excited as you all are for the conversation to get started. And also, I hope this isn't your first Zoom with us, but if it is, welcome and let us know in the chat. Um, just very briefly, the Writers Guild Foundation is the nonprofit arm of the WGA West, and it's our mission to provide resources and educational opportunities to aspiring and emerging uh, screenwriters, as well as established screenwriters, while preserving and promoting the history and craft of writing for the screen. So we host events like this virtually. We also have some events in person uh, and the Los Angeles area. And if you're in LA or visiting in the near future, we do have a library with tens of thousands of scripts, reference books, development material. Uh, you can learn more about our library, browse our catalog, schedule an appointment on our website. Uh, that information is all available at wgfoundation.org. We'll also post the link in the chat. I definitely hope that this isn't anyone's first time using Zoom, but I just wanted to remind everyone joining us to please direct your questions to the Q&A box, which is found in that bottom bar of your Zoom window. Um, if you ask your questions in the chat, there's a good chance we won't see it. Um, we definitely encourage you all to engage in the chat, especially if anything discussed resonates with you. Uh, but please remember, just be respectful and kind to one another. And that is about enough out of me. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening. She's a writer, artist, and storyteller from Guerrero, Mexico, who's been featured on Lifetime's Her America, Apple TV's Dear, and 271 Films as We Are Here. She's a passionate advocate for immigrant rights who's worked in the nonprofit sector to advocate for immigration reform and currently serves as a senior manager of entertainment engagement at Define American. Please join me in welcoming Jose Valencia. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. And oh, it's a little, it's always fun to hear your 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 bio being read back to you. Uh, and I'm going to do that to our panelists too, because we have an incredible group of panelists. I'm very, very excited to be talking with you all today. Um, just a little bit about Define American. Define American is an organization that empowers diverse and nuanced storytelling about immigrant experiences across mediums and industries through our research, partnerships, and storyteller engagement. We were founded in 2011 by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and Tony nominated producer, Jose Antonio Vargas. Our work is helping audiences see immigrants with their full humanity. And we are, we're very, very excited to be hosting this panel in collaboration with Storyline Partners, of course, the WGA Foundation. This panel is the first in a series on promoting issues and communities affected by the upcoming elections and the narrative, narratives that surround them. Define American is a proud member of Storyline Partners, a nonprofit collective of issue and community-based organizations advising on entertainment narratives. For more information, you can check out storylinepartners.com. Of course, want to give them a huge shout out for having Define American commence this series. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we're going to get started on the questions. Uh, feel free, if you have any questions, um, to put them in the chat. We're going to dedicate the last 15 minutes of this panel to answering, uh, answering audience questions. So first up, we have Mike Goyo. Born in Haiti, raised in Boston, graduated from the University of Massachusetts with a degree in theater. After college, he moved to L.A. to pursue a writing career, first landing in reality TV, where he worked his way up from assistant on shows like American Idol, So You Think You Can Dance, the MTV Movie Awards, and the Emmys, to a producer on shows like GSN's Common Knowledge and Ease the Common Section. A few years later, Mike would make the jump to scripted television, writing on the first two seasons of the critically acclaimed and successful Netflix dramedy Ginny and Georgia, and the final season of the critically acclaimed Max series Insecure. Mike then went on to co-create, co-showrun, and executive produce All Black's original series, Send Help, and is also the founder of Black Boy Rights Media, a talent incubator for marginalized voices, and home to the Black Boy Rights, Black Girl Rights Mentorship Initiative, which is a pipeline program for pre-WGA Black writers. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Excited to have you. Next up. <laughs> 
<laughs> Next up, we have Bernardo Cubria, who is a Mexican playwright and screenwriter based in Los Angeles. For film, he penned the feature screenplay Like It Used To Be and Guerrero, which Gina Rodriguez is attached to direct and star in. And he was a 2023 Sundance Screenwriters Lab Fellow for his screenplay Kill Your Idols, which he co-wrote, and the Carlos Lopez Estrada is attached to direct. He was also a writer on season three of Acapulco on Apple TV+. Plus, and his play Crabs in a Bucket won the 2024 Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle Award for Best Writing. His play, The Play You Want, premiered at LA's Road Theater in 2022, garnering Cubria both a Stage Raw Award and a Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle nomination for playwriting. It received its regional premiere at the Milagro Theater in Portland in 2023. In 2019, Cubria was nominated for the Ovation, Stage Raw, and Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle Best Playwright Awards for his play, The Giant Void in My Soul. Other playwriting awards include the Smith Prize for Political Theater. Yeah. Thank you and for having me. Excited to have you all. And then last but certainly not least, we have Mujan Solpagari, who is an Emmy-nominated Iranian-American comedy writer who has written on shows like TVS as The Detour, Apple TV's The Helpsters, Tiny Chef, Sesame Street, and many various pilots, and an upcoming DC and Amazon animated series. She is also an actor with credits on At Home with Amy Sedaris, Last Week Tonight, Gremlin's Secret of the Mogwai, Tuning Out the News, and so much more, and is also the co-creator and performer on Mission to Zix, a sci-fi audio comedy series on Maximum Fun. You can sometimes find her performing on stage at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in both LA and New York, and she is currently working on a feature about her brother's prom. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and get started, if that's all right. Let's do it. Awesome. So first of all, obviously, we are in an election year, and there's been a lot of negative rhetoric, specifically around immigrants and immigration, including the notion that immigrants are all criminals. As writers, do you see a role for yourself in deliberately helping to combat these myths? If so, why? And if not, why not? I know it's a really, really <laughs> to get started, but we're just gonna dive in. No, I think I think that's a great question. I think for me uh, personally, I, I do um, take some level of responsibility about the type of stories that I tell uh, and or want to tell. Um, and they also are stories that are just missing from the zeitgeist. So being able to be, a, uh, to write and, and fill that space is not only important to just expanding our ideas of, you know, what different stories look like, but also uh, being able to speak to marginalized individuals who aren't often um, seen on television, um, which is important because the only way for people to see themselves in other people as if they actually see them on screen, right? If they actually are able to build some sort of like familiarity with them um, and to like dive into the universality of like who we are as people, you know what I mean? So yeah, I like to share stories about marginalized individuals so that you can see yourselves in them. And in that way, it's the only way to really understand someone that you may not like really know all that well. I think that a lot of times when we talk about criminality and talk about folks who are um, being villainized, it's a lot of times because, you know, you, you don't know much about them. So it's easy for, say, the media to portray someone a certain way and for you to just believe it because that's all you've really seen. So, yes, I do take it upon myself to tell stories about people that you don't often hear about that are who are normally associated with like crime or being villainized, but are actually just people like everyone else. So, yeah. Yeah, you bring up a great point about about people. You know, you 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 see and you you understand. There's something called parasocial contact theory, where pe where audiences specifically create these imagined friendships with the characters they're watching. So 
TV is just incredibly powerful, especially when we're representing groups that um, that audiences may not have real world contact with. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say, as like an immigrant, you know, I came to this country young, like three years old, but uh, television for me was like the third parent, as much as my parents probably would disagree with that. <laughs> and I learned about American culture that way. And like, saw myself in programs that way. Like I watched TGIF, like they were my family. And so as a writer now, I, I take that as the immigrant perspective or as an Iranian perspective. I often feel, I don't know if you two have had this experience, but I often feel sometimes I am the only person of color or um, person with an immigrant background in a room. So I often find like, I, I very much have to fight for that uh, mm-hmm. like character to be more developed. And I work in comedy a lot. So it's about creating characters who are not just fully formed and aren't, aren't just one word or one stereotype, a type, uh, especially for immigrants. It's very important to write characters that you laugh with and not at anymore. <laughs> uh, and as like a comedian, I've always been a very precious about my own family story because I didn't want people to laugh at my family and to see my family as like the stereotype. And so, I don't know, yeah. I. I feel like I do feel like a lot of responsibility in helping create the story and helping make fully realize characters that are funny. So people who live in places that don't have immigrant friends or don't see other diversity around them uh, have access to that and see people as people. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Dulce, you probably share this experience, but growing up, you know, like it was almost like hilariously painful how Mexicans were portrayed in the media in this country, you know? because it had nothing to do with my experience. And when I would go home, it had nothing to do with the people I was dealing with because they were nuanced human beings as all human beings are. And what I was watching on TV was just shitty writing. (laughs) It was like this two dimensional bullshit about, and I was like, what? And like, now I have to say, it makes me laugh because growing up when we would go back to Mexico for the summers or for Christmas, people were like, oh man, are you scared to go to Mexico? Because that's the story they were being told. And now everyone I know in LA is like going to day FF for bachelor parties, you know, and you're like, dude, it's just, I, you know, it, it, so I only know how to write my lived experience and the people that I know, and they're all nuanced human beings who are happen to be Mexican, you know? And so I'm passionate about that because I think it's better writing, you know, there's, they're just more interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> to your point, um, the the yellow filter that's used oh, to yeah. then anytime you're in Mexico, <laughs> like on film and TV. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh and then keeping on the subject of of criminality and specifically as it relates to to immigrants, um, our last research report with USC's Norman Lear Center found that 40% of all immigrant characters on TV were portrayed in association with crime. This was an all time high since we first began tracking this. And obviously we've talked about it just like now, like you, 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 you believe what you see. So if audiences are commonly seeing immigrants portrayed with criminality, that's what they're going to associate immigrants with. So question for you all is why do you think it is that this narrative persists and what uh, are the real world consequences of perpetuating the stereotype? And and you've touched upon it a bit, so feel free to elaborate on that. <laughs> um, hmm. I, th- I think the issue is, is twofold, right? It's like a two pronged issue kind of, kind of coming from each side from the, um, from the perspective of like, I guess the industry, it is um, that it's pretty much been like part of a model in terms of uh, a lot of the way procedurals are, are are built out, a lot of the way crime shows are built out. And it's kind of like, you know, uh, a model that's existed for a long time. Um, so when it comes to down to certain characters there are certain kind of like archetypes that have just existed that work that have proven to to work so the industry is kind of conditioned to keep going down that road of things that have like worked for them in terms of like uh, uh, crime shows drug shows uh if you think of like bmf if you think of power if you think of like you know uh different types of shows uh, like that a lot of the main characters that are involved in those groups are, are you know, 
our crime groups are like of color or something like that. Um, there's the industry side of it. The um, consumer side of it is that's like what a lot of folks have been enjoying. That's, you know, it, you know, the industry um, makes those kinds of shows because those are and end up being the really popular shows. Like I said before, BMF, um, Narcos, um, Power, shows like that, right? So the issue is the industry itself needs to take a chance on just creating other types of content that have the possibility of being just as popular. But because the industry is more risk averse, they're less likely to want to do that. But it doesn't mean that us as creators um, aren't pushing for that type of content to be made where it's like not having to do with criminals, not having to do with um, um, creating like the, making the person of color like this, this villain, right? Sometimes we just want to have stories of like us just living our lives, <laughs> you know, uh, expressing the different uh, intersectionalities of us, um, coming of age stories, um, like all those things are, are really important um, too. But at times the industry is just uh, not wanting to take that risk because A, they're wanting to stick to what works and B, the audiences already respond to that in a way that's like favorable to them. Um, but again, it's not to say that, you know, you show the audience something else and they will be, you know, su not surprised per se, but it, it'll be refreshing <laughs> to them to be able to see something else, to be able to see themselves at times and also make that popular. So it, it kind of takes both sides to make that happen. And it's going to take the industry to take initiative to want to do that. Um, and take the risk to do that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm happy for Narcos to exist in the world if we also had, like, 20 other shows that showed us in all the ways of our existence. Right. We're not a monolith, right? So I only feel sort of a frustration at that show's success, not because I love that it's hiring uh, people from our community and that it's employing those people, and I think a lot of that work is really good and nuanced, but... It's just about allowing us to express all the shades of us. Like I also grew up obsessed with TGIF and I like comedy and like, I wanna see us in those things because Cheers was my favorite show growing up. And I know that mm -hmm. our community can exist in Cheers. Like we can mm -hmm. sit at a bar all day and we can make jokes and we can have our friends and will they, won't they? Like we are capable of all of that. And so it's just frustrating that we don't also get those opportunities. But like you just said, it's about the brave badass execs who take that risk right and by the way every time someone does take one of those risks those are the shows that then everybody talks about right right so i get it look if it's your job and you have kids you're trying to be safe and you're following an algorithm but all the shows we all talk about are always the ones that break the mold and then that's when people get on a call with you and go hey uh, can you do mexican baby reindeer <laughs> you know <laughs> and you're like well but you wouldn't have wanted that from me a month ago you know so mm -hmm. it's just about all of us taking that risk and us continuing to write those things and making them so fucking good that they have to produce them, you know? Um, yeah. 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 What everything that's been said is said. Uh, <laughs> it's perfect and amazing. Also, you know, I think sometimes it also, everything that the programs we see sometimes are reflective of the rhetoric and misinformation that exists in the news cycle too mm -hmm. about immigrants and like, for example, like the experience of being Middle Eastern uh, for a while, even as an actor, we only have terrorist roles because we're only seen mm -hmm. as terrorists. And the people who do have shows and are creating shows only see us as terrorists because of the news. So it is. It's about just bringing up real voices and voices of people who have that experience and are of, are of those backgrounds and having their stories. So, yeah, just like more of a chance for people who. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think all of you are doing that and you, and you all mentioned you know your your responsibility in writing these stories and, and continuing to write these so you know as as again we're talking about immigrants and how and the narratives that exist surrounding them especially especially now where we're in an election year and we hear all these stereotypes right immigrants are are draining taxpayers they are to blame for the economy they're uneducated they're they're coming in hordes all these all these negative rhetorics so 
Can you talk about any of your personal projects or stories that you're currently developing that are just by existing and by existing and being created by you all are helping debunk these these uh, narratives? Um, I, I, I'm so right now. I am uh, very excited to just. For a long time in my career, I really haven't done anything like about my upbringing or Persian experience or Iranian experience because I didn't want to be boxed in to being considered just like the Iranian. But then, especially with everything happening in the news, there's so many hilarious, embarrassing, funny, terrible stories in my family. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing material. What am I doing? I'm sitting on gold mines here. And so I'm uh, hoping to develop a feature based on my brother's prom. It, he was the first one in my entire family to ever go to prom in 1993. And uh, because my parents were raised on watching Lifetime movies, they were afraid of American culture, which is like the opposite of what we're talking about. And my mom truly believed prom was short for promiscuous. And so the feature really uh, is about uh, like, uh, really, yeah. Uh, and so my, my parents were like, sure, you can go to prom, but we're going with you. And this really did happen. We all went with my brother to prom oh my God, and amazing. he had multiple <laughs> dates because they, he didn't understand having two dates was a thing. And it's just like a very funny, hilarious story that my grandma was there too, seating pomegranates. She got lost at one point <laughs> and we found her. Like, it's just a story about just the embarrassing wonderfulness of being a family that's a fish out of water trying to exist in America and how this just funny and wonderful and it's about sibling dynamics and it's about family dynamics it's about crushes it's about a lot of universal experiences we go through in our lives so it's been really fun to be like oh yeah this is something I can do and I feel and it feels just just fun to like even talk to my family about it and to bring up like a bright happy story to this world about Iranians or Middle Easterns or anybody not from the United States <laughs> yeah I love that. I can't wait yeah. to watch that. Me too. Oh yeah. my Thank God. You. It sounds too. amazing. <laughs> so I, I was an actor at first. And one of the reasons I stopped acting was because, you know, the kind of roles that I was being, you know, given to audition for were things that didn't fit me. Like badass, like narcos, right? Like no one buys that from me. Like I'm not intimidating. I don't fight. I don't do these things, right? And whenever I'd go into the room, I felt like I was like putting on this costume that didn't fit. And I knew I was going to bomb. And so when I became a writer was to take back that power. And so I just don't write things that I don't fucking like, you know, like unless I get paid and then I write a lot of things I don't like. But like if I, do, I when it comes from my soul, it's the stuff that I love. And the things I love are, you know, like the movie that was just shared with us. Like, I want to see that movie because that sounds funny and wonderful and human and three dimensional. And, you know, it reminds me of me and my friends. Like I grew up, I went to this international school in Houston and we were all people, we were all immigrants, you know, and the kind of hijinks that we got into, I never saw represented, you know, and so I think I'm a much better writer when I'm writing things that I am passionate about and that I identify with, you know. So if I tried to write Narcos Puerto Vallarta, it would be fucking terrible. It would suck because I don't know that world and I don't care about it, you know? I only feel sadness about it, you know? Like I don't, I can't write that way, not well. Mm -hmm. I, I have like the bitter of the business and, the, and I guess the sweet part <laughs> of the business. We'll start with the, I guess, bitter part. Uh, and I don't even know how much I can say about this, but a major streaming platform just killed an uh, animated feature that has been, I mean, I've been on it for the, I had been on it for the past two and a half years, but it had been going for the past six years. It was an uh, animated feature about Haiti, mm -hmm. um, which we don't get. We don't get those. And it was going to be major, but they killed it. They canned it post strike post all this stuff so um that learned about that this past week so that was like oh <laughs> we're so close um so that was unfortunate the sweet part is i'm writing a feature now that is getting made um that is about like it's a coming of age story about this star high school soccer player who's undocumented um and you know who's 
uh, basically trying to make it through high school <laughs> while also trying to help his team win and, and stay in, in, in the country. It's about, you know, just um, a feel good story about um, making it, you know? Um, so really happy about that and how, how that's going. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure any of the writers up here could attest to the um, wins and the losses that happen in this business. But so glad that we get to continue to tell our story. So that's why, you know, it's so important to to talk about the, the, the sweet parts of it, because one thing may not be happening, but it doesn't mean that the, you know, the buck stops there. You know what I mean? You, you keep going and you just try to make as much dope, beautiful content about immigrants as possible. So, yeah. And Mike, I want to stay with you because, well, first of all, like, congratulations on, on the one that is moving forward. And I'm sorry to hear about the other one, but on, on that topic, um, so Black immigrants in particular are so underrepresented in media. Uh, we've been studying representation about immigrant characters, and there's only been one year that Black immigrants weren't underrepresented, and that was because of one show, uh, Bob Hart's Abishola. Uh, and it shouldn't be the weight of one single show to carry the representation of an entire group of people. So how, how do you think it is like that studios can do a better job of investing in stories representing specifically black immigrants. That's a great question. Um, I think oftentimes, I mean, the the business is is very it's 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 um financially driven, right? They 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 go to where they feel that the dollars are, um, uh, and it's just up to us as creators, but it's also up to us as an audience to convince them that no, like we need to be looking at these other spaces um, where, you know, people who aren't seen exist um, and we need to be able to shed a light, shed light on it. Um, speaking specifically about Haiti, it's, you know, a country that, you know, has been through a lot um, and uh, continues to go through a lot right now as, you know, in terms of the, the current um, you know, state uh, of the country. But a lot of what you don't hear is about how beautiful the country is, you know, how um, its importance in history, um, its importance in America, you know, ha having Louisiana, <laughs> the Louisiana Purchase, um, and as well as just, you know, other um, um, nations or enslaved nations, like getting their independence. Like Haiti was the first independent um you know Haiti was the first country to gain its independence from you know being enslaved so we don't talk about those things and we should um and my mission has been to to continue that conversation you know um it's it's just a tough thing to do when you know certain things like this happen where you know you're you're trying to do something and it gets canned <laughs> Mm -hmm. um um so to i guess to put a button on it 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 takes us having an investment mm -hmm. in ensuring that you know we can make it happen um but also um having a, a financial investment in in trying to to make it happen and sometimes that financial investment needs to come from outside of the industry you know, um, and, you know, independent uh, investors who are wanting to um, shed light on this, on this space. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's, I mean, um, maybe what it's going to have to take if Hollywood isn't wanting to tell those stories. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to go back to Mujan. Um, there was something you said earlier uh, you know, when when you were talking about your family, that you wanted to make sure people were laughing with them and not at them. You're obviously a talented writer, actor. You're also a comedian. So uh, how to you, like, does comedy play a role in the way people see the world? And how do you determine how you use comedy in your own personal work? 
I mean, I think comedy is the great unifier when it comes to so many social issues, even dealing with hard topics. If you come at it with a comedic lens, it makes it easier to swallow. And and sometimes you can trick people into caring about a character by making them very funny. <laughs> like I think Superstore is like a good example of like a show that had like an undocumented character that they took a while to present. And by that time, the people cared about that character and they saw him for not a perfect person who was just quirky and wonderful. And like, then it's like, oh, he has a real issue that some of you were afraid of, but he's an actual person and you care about him. And it's all through the lens of comedy. Um, personally, as like a performer, I, you know, I started doing UCB, the Upright Citizens Brigade, like improv and theater in my 20s. And I've always felt like I was an other in that world sometimes because it was so referential based, based on what you grew up with as a non-immigrant child or, uh, or they would like doing improv. Sometimes the power wasn't in you because they would label you as something, but I always fought against it. And I always, like if someone labeled me as like a stereotype from being Middle Eastern, I would take it and run with it and make it goddamn funny. <laughs> Uh, and that kind of gave me a bit of courage, like moving on in my career. And, you know, being a comedian, your identity is very important. And I've always, it's very important to me, like being a writer, being an actor, who I am is so important to everything that I do. And I, and being in writer's rooms, being the comedy, the Iranian person, sometimes there was one time I realized I was hired because I was specifically like Iranian, which is like, okay, that's good. But it, I hope it's done for a good reason and not to be like, we wrote an Iranian storyline and you happen to be in the room. We can just say we could do whatever with it, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I I think I went a little off the rails, but I guess what I was trying to say is, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just who I am being like this, an immigrant being an Iranian, having living in two worlds, it defines every part of the comedy that I do. And I... Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I found in like the jobs I do, even working for children's shows like Sesame Street or Helpsters, that's one way to communicate with children and parents is through comedy. Like it's it's the most strong muscle we use sometimes in communicating issues like immigration, issues like diversity to a wide set of people. Because if you can get a bunch of people laughing together, then they're more open to like listening and being empathetic towards that you know, subject. So, so yeah, I also, uh, I wanted to say, I just want to say originally I wanted, I had like a weird small story to say <laughs> about one time I went to an airport and yeah. it was in Spain. And I realized it was all these people from all these different backgrounds and ages and creeds. were all laughing at something together. And I was like, what is happening? So I went over to it and it was uh, a Spanish a little miniature statue. I think it's called a, uh, do you guys know? Cag Cagan? Cagan? Yeah. Yeah. Cagan? <laughs> It's a little man who's uh, basically his pants are off and he's uh, taking a poop. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this statue became like the universal thing at this airport where like, no matter where you were from, everyone thought it was the funniest thing. People were like hugging, smiling, laughing, pointing at the statue. And I was like, oh, comedy is a good career. <laughs> That's um, funny you say that if you don't mind. But so I went to clown school as one does. Everyone does that. Obviously, it's a normal thing to do with your life. But uh, it was all people from all over the world. And our clowning teacher would be like, the one thing that will make everyone laugh is shitting and falling. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> that's the great unifier. That's all human beings. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's so um, dope that you worked on um, Sesame Street. I, yeah. I, love, I love that. Yeah. That's it so makes my uh, me a cool aunt, which is all I care about. <laughs> I mean, Sesame Street is probably the reason I didn't have to go to ESL classes when I came to this country. So but we love Sesame Street. Um, but also, um, you know, I love that you said comedy to trick people into caring. And I just have to give a shout out to um I didn't work on it, but Define American did work on Superstore and closely crafting Mateo's character. And the thing I do love about Mateo is that I found him incredibly annoying as a character, but I still loved him. And that's, you know, that's immigrant characters. We don't all have to be perfect. We can be annoying. Right. We can be a little, a little um selfish too. Like we can have all these multitudes so I have to give a quick shout out to that um and then I want to bring it over to Bernardo uh, Acapulco is currently airing its third season so congratulations on that I'm really excited to binge watch it I'm a binger so I have to watch it once it's 
once sure. it's finished airing. <laughs> um, but to bring it back to, you know, a conversation, you've, and you've been bringing this up about, you know, you would be a terrible writer for Narcos Puerto Vallarta, um, but you're an excellent writer in Acapulco. And it's, Acapulco specifically is a show not only set in Mexico, but also like has all these Mexican characters and does not have narcos in the show. Can you talk about, um, especially because Mexican specifically and criminality are often conflated, uh, did this, was this intentional? Did this come up in the writing process? And if so, can you talk to us about those conversations? Yeah, well, first off, the people who created the show, this was one of their huge mission statements. You know, Austin Winsberg is like someone who was really passionate about that, really wanted to not make that the story. And, you know, I was not a part of season one and season two. I was a huge fan. I mean, I will never forget watching the pilot episode. And I cried like a baby because I had never seen that. It was just like Latino people speaking in Spanish and English when they're supposed to speak in Spanish and English, right? Mm -hmm. And there was so much Spanish in the show and I wasn't afraid of it. And it was just this positive show about this kid with a dream and there was no criminality at all, right? Like that's not at all what that show's about. And it meant so much to me. And you realize how, how hurtful it is and how much pain you have from not having that, right? Because when you do see it, it feels like, wow, you know? And I was just a fan. So when I got to interview for season three, I was so thirsty in that interview. And I was just like, y'all, I this is my dream is to do this kind of content because this is what, uh, my experience of Mexico is this. Like, this is the people I grew up with. This is my grandfather. Like Don Pablo, who's on that show, is my fucking grandfather. Like, I can't tell you. It's so uh, powerful, you know? Like, I can't help but tear up. My wife makes fun of me when I see him because I'd never seen my grandfather on screen. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I'm just so grateful to the people who run that show because they have fought for it. And what matters there is comedy and character. Like that's what they fucking care about, you know? So those are the conversations we're having in the room. Um, yeah, and I'll just quickly shout out our showrunner, Sam Laybourne, who is not Mexican. Uh, he did such an amazing job of creating a space where when certain conversations came up, he would just like back out. And then the like six Latinos in the room would talk and then he would be like, okay, cool. That's what we're doing, you know? And that is so rare. <laughs> I'm sure the other two writers on this panel can attest to getting notes on your culture from people outside the culture. I could go on for hours about that. I won't do that and get fired from certain projects, but you know, <laughs> like I have had those horrible notes. And so to have someone like that, again, I will say, I'm bringing up crying a lot, but me and the other writers would cry in the room a lot because we would be like, wait, did you just ask us for our opinion? <laughs> did you just ask us to recommend Mexican directors and Mexican writers PAs? And like, you know, it comes from the top down. Mm -hmm. And anyway, yeah, I could go on for hours, but that's why I love that show. I'm so proud to be a part of it. And I have to, I have to give like another shout out to Acapulco as a show because I'm from Guerrero, which is where the show is set. And I've had so many conversations with people who don't know anything about Guerrero, except what they see on news. And they always ask me, oh, like narcos, because um, drug trafficking used to be like what it was known for. Um, and so to have a show that's not that at all, but it's still in my home state, it feels really, really, really wonderful. So thank you. Um, next question for all of you all, uh, is in, in the writer's room or have you all worked with cultural consultants? Um, so what is your process, uh, like, uh, either in your personal projects or in a writer's room? I mean, I'll quickly share that the first cultural consultant I ever worked with was you, Dulce. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> yeah. Which was amazing you know, uh, and was helpful, by the way, to be reminded of the blind spots you have within your own culture, right? Which I think is also important because we're always told to speak on behalf of every single fucking Mexican of all time, right? And so uh, for our script, Kill Your Idols, you came on and it was just so wonderful. And so, because it was coming from someone who had the same mission statement for the project that we did, but was just making it better and doper and funnier, you know? And that was such a meaningful call. So thank you. 
gonna cry thank you that yeah. I yeah. honored one honored that I was um your first experience with that but I I love 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 that script so um yeah just thank you thank you I think for myself I worked on a show called Claws it was on TNT it was about um um uh a bunch of women who worked in the Dell salon, but it was really a front for like a money laundering scheme. Uh, and Color of Change came to speak to us a few times um, about uh, different characters. And I know that I didn't, they'll say we didn't meet until we um, sent help with premiering. So would have loved to have had Define America um, uh when we were like you know in production for send help um but we also had glad um came in and chatted to us about uh, one of our characters on send help who's um uh, pansexual um but yeah I, I think it's incredibly important to have um those groups in the room to give their thoughts mm. I've worked, you know, on it happens more often in um, kids programming because they want to mm -hmm. be very conscious and they're educational. And so on Sesame Street, there's definitely a lot of culture consultants. And on the show, I worked on it called The Helpsters on Apple TV because it was also an internationally distributed show. And so Apple was very conscious of making sure even uh, like a small thing, like showing the back of a shoe would be culturally insensitive to a certain culture. So we would like change small aspects of our show. Uh, but recently I worked on a project for PBS Digital with the creator of The Helpsters, uh, Tim McKeon, in which he wanted to create a storyline uh, about the Hmong culture, which is an indigenous group in Southeast Asia and East Asia, but neither of us, of course, are. And so we brought a someone who is of Hmong cultural background to be like the specialist and read through our scripts. But in addition to that, when we actually casted the actors who are also of that background, we had them give their like advice and like be like, how would, would you, is what we're saying? Like sometimes if you get advice, it could be very academic, but if you have the actor go through, they can make it more conversational and natural. And so we wanted to make sure like this specific subject uh, about like a kid sharing why touching on the head is would is not a, a culturally correct thing to do in their culture. We wanted to do it in a sweet way, in a funny way, in a way that was conversational. And so having the actors there absolutely helped and having the a person of that background read the script and give the line in a way they would say it in their house was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll add one thing. Um, and I think Bernardo, you brought it up, but I think a few of you have, have mentioned it is, you know, just because you represent or are part of a community doesn't mean that you represent the entirety of that community. Um, as our founder, Jose Antonio Vargas has said, you know, 45 million immigrants in the United States, that's 45 million ways of being an immigrant. So uh, it should never just be on the writers to represent because at the end of the day, you're writers first and you're good at that. So that's what you should be doing. Um, I'll but, tell a but, very quick story, just it's yes. like a quick funny story. But when I was in New York, and I was a playwright, I got invited once to a play reading by someone who was not Latino. And it was about uh, a chicken factory in El Salvador. And it was like about workers there. And I had been invited to be the like, to make sure they had gotten it right. <laughs> oh, no, you know, like, just two <laughs> things I have no, no experience <laughs> of, right. And I'll never forget after the reading, the whole room turns to me and is like, so? Like, did we do it, you know? And I was like, this is fucking nuts, man. Like, these people are insane. Like, how, would, what? You know, it's just so crazy the positions we're put in sometimes. And sometimes because of work, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to know when to accept, when to say no. But anyway, that, that for me was like so emblematic of what it is to sometimes carry this burden of like mm -hmm. speaking for all your community. It's insane, you know? And it shouldn't fall on you. <laughs> but um, the last question I have for all of you before we kick it over to audience questions is, when was the first time you saw yourself represented on TV? And if that hasn't happened yet, feel free to talk about that too. It's funny, I think my answer was more like what my family believed the first time we were on television. And this isn't a perfect answer because it was it was the show Perfect Strangers, and it was Balky. 
because he's from a fictional Mediterranean island. And as Iranians, that's all we had at that time. And so we were obsessed with Balki. And even till this day, my brother and my cousin still call each other uh, Cousin Larry <laughs> Balki. Like, it's because it's he was just a happy, joyous guy in the world. And we're like, we'll take him. He's one of ours. But but yeah, and then weirdly enough, after that, Catherine Bell played uh, a colonel in the television show Jag because she was like the only Iranian on television. And I was like, she's I'll take it. I'm I'm going to look into what it is to be a Jag. I like looked up the application like I was going to follow the footsteps, but I didn't. So, yeah. Love that. I don't know. I think it's different based on like like as a black person, as a gay person, as an immigrant, like I think it's all different. Um, the first show as a gay person that really resonated with me was Noah's Ark. So shout out to like Patrick and Ian Polk for Noah's Ark. Um, as just a black person, like just wanting to like see myself on TV, like someone that I, I feel like really resonated with, with me growing up, probably Theo Huxtable feeling like okay kid high school just trying to get through just trying to make it through, make it through high school and survive their parents um and um as a haitian immigrant it send help a show that i had to create so, there you have it <laughs> uh I mean, my childhood answer is probably Carousel de Niños, and that was in Mexico and played in Mexico. So, like, that was when I saw myself because it was in our country. And then, but the, the thing that really had the most impact on my life was John Leguizamo's Freak. I was in high school. <laughs> I saw it on HBO, and I just couldn't believe that it existed. I couldn't believe he was allowed to be on HBO, that it was a play that he got to be his mom and his dad and his family. And I mean, it changed my life. It, it's what made me go to theater school. You know, it, I, I can't uh, put into words what that thing did for me. Mm -hmm. it, it really changed the course of my life. Power of TV, man. Yeah, and he was funny. That too, he was so funny, you know. I love hearing your answers. I'm gonna now, we have some audience questions. So I'm going to just read the first one that I have here. Okay. Um, from Emily, I'm half white, half not. And growing up in the Midwest, I found myself hiding the non-white half of my identity. Any advice for tapping into your whole cultural self so you can be a better writer? Mm. That's a great question. Yeah. Um. It's 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 a nuanced question, nuanced answer in the sense that like forget writing for now. I think just tapping mm -hmm. into yourself as an individual, um, and is is really what's at the core of this. You know what I mean? Um, and um, growing more comfortable with all the different facets of yourself and exploring that. I think is really important. Um, and once you're able to do that, it becomes a more comfortable act to do in your writing. Um, so I guess that's my answer to that. Anyone else want to answer that? I'll say quickly, so I have kids. I have a six-year-old boy and a two-year-old daughter. And it's really cool to see just how many parts of them exist because mm -hmm. they I keep discovering them you know? Yeah. And I think there's like a not so nuanced way of seeing my son, Diego, who's half Mexican, half Jewish, and being like, he's Mexican and Jewish. But he's so much more than that. Those are two of his superpowers, you know, that we are giving to him that we're celebrating for him. But I think it's just about learning to love all these parts of you, the good, the bad, and really diving in and being okay with the uncomfortable, you know, therapy has really helped me be okay with all the parts of me, oh, you know, if the that's helpful. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I mean, Albania, my therapist, shout out. I can recommend her to anyone on this call. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it, these are little parts of us that are important, but they all make us, they're all us, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I had the experience growing up in a very Irish Catholic 
town as like the only brown kid. And so a lot of those things back then I wanted, I very much wanted to be just like them. I didn't want to be Iranian. Like I even pretended being Irish because my friend said, if you put your nose together and it sticks, you're Irish. And so long story. <laughs> it was like, my mom went to a parent conference thing and they're like, you're Irish. Anyway, uh, but as I've gotten older, I found those moments to be so funny. Like all the things I did to actually hide who I was are moments that are so funny now. And so it's like leaning into what you did to hide yourself while actually being the other half as well. So it's like finding the humor in those moments. Uh, and yeah, being proud of it, exactly. Yeah, because it's who you are, yeah. 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 And also you're gonna keep discovering yourself. You're gonna keep discovering diff different facets of yourself, um, you know, and, and growing more and more comfortable in that. I think it's a, a lifelong journey to do that. Um, and, you know, your writing will continue to get better or will just continue to evolve as you evolve as a, as a person. So, yeah. Nice. Um, next question from Anna. How do you, as an immigrant POC, pitch yourself as a storyteller that can write stories and characters beyond those of your own culture and background? Wait, say that one more time. Got you. <laughs> How do you, as an immigrant POC, pitch yourself as a storyteller that can write stories and characters beyond those of your culture and background? Okay. <laughs> okay. The thing is, um, the question is problematic in itself because to say that we have to pitch ourselves to be convincing, to be able to write different genres that are outside of who we are is, you know, part of the problem. Cause it's not really a thing. Like as writers, as creatives, we have an ability to just go into different worlds. Like that's by education, by creativity, by whatever, that's what, that's what we do. So I think, at times part of the issue in the industry as it pertains to being a person of color who's wanting to write something that's the genre or not, or not seen as like something that they can do, we end up in a situation where we might be pitching ourselves or are supposed to be conditioned to pitch ourselves when in actuality, no, we don't need to pitch ourselves. We are creatives, we are writers by profession. We can dive into different spaces, into different worlds. It's what we do. Um, so I guess to answer that, um, we just do it, <laughs> we just do it. And, 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 and I guess, um, in, in, when you are going into a situation where you're having to pitch yourself for a particular project, of course you pitch your, your take on it, your idea on it, like how you would bring something to that world. And a lot of the times it's not necessarily pitching yourself as this, um, for instance, Haitian immigrant who's like, I'm, but I can do that. It's more so, well, I've experienced universally what this character may have experienced before just by virtue of like being a human being or being a man or being mm -hmm. someone who's been in, in an embarrassing situation. And that's more so the take, that's the pitch, more so than like trying to convince them that as a Haitian person, I can write about this Jewish person. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Just as a writer, I just only, I just write. Uh, and just I'm good. hired just to write. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's for me, it hasn't been, uh, a, I've, I've not experienced that. Mm. Like, I'll say for me, I do only interview for uh, Latino shit, right? But that's the stuff I want to write. So I'm thrilled about that. And mm -hmm. the one good thing about that for me is that then I'm allowed to write a comedy and a musical and a serious dramatic thing. And that's what I'm more interested in because like was said by other people on this panel, you know, I'm more than, I'm funny. I, I like funny things, but I also like super, you know, I like Cool Runnings as much as I like Phantom Thread. Like I love both those fucking movies and they're so different, but that's being a human. So I think all writers can write anything as long as they do the work and they're passionate about it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, question from Sean. Do you believe criminality portrayals are outright, 
outright inappropriate or only flawed because of the bad slash stereotypical writing? Is there a purpose in genuinely exploring the experiences of immigrant criminals to explore the complex circumstances of economic barriers for marginalized communities that sometimes lead to the choice to commit crime? And Chris asked a similar question. The loaded one. <laughs> I was going to say, just, you know, the statistic that you gave, which is like 40% of the stories mm -hmm. being told, that's the problem. That's really the problem. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can have an incredible criminal character who's fully developed, but if that was, but that's what's, you know, that's not happening. It's like every 40% of it is just criminal. So I think what we're trying to address and hopefully change, it's like, yeah, we can also be a criminal and be incredible and have a background and we can go and learn about that and be educated about that. But also we are so many other things. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Charlize Theron and Monster is like a terrible criminal person, right? But it's so nuanced and amazing. Like, I would love to see a Latina woman play that version yeah. of this thing because it is nuanced. And it is, you know, the problem with so many of these characters is that they just suck. They're poorly written, you know? And so they are two dimensional and they have accents that no one speaks in and they say words that no one uses. And, you know, it's just <laughs> weird. So it's bad, you know? Uh, but I'm all for things that are really nuanced and complex and really explore why people are led to those lives, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, and I think you all have brought it up over the course of the panel. It's it's also the problem of just, you know, having investing in procedurals character or like procedural shows being the only shows that have immigrant characters. It's, you know... Let's have a cheers with immigrant characters. Let's have like other shows and other types of shows that have immigrant characters just existing and not just be criminals so that we can move away from that 40%. But also just existing in multiple genres too, mm -hmm. you know, like just sci-fi, you know, fantasy, um, uh, more, heck, more period um, pieces, you know? Agree a hundred percent. All right, a uh, question. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Sorry, got a lot. Um. All right. Um, from Hanif, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name. I'm originally from Pakistan and was put on deportation proceedings just for being born in Pakistan. I won the case, but um, but it destroyed years of my hard work here. Even with my career and script successes, it feels like I'm still in the deportation proceedings and I feel invisible. How does one break this feeling of being invisible? Mm. I mean, first off, I'm so sorry you're going through that. That is horrible and super fucked up. And I just I really hate that that's what you're going through. And, um, you know, I think, um, I think things get better. There are uh, lights at the ends of these, you know, experiences uh, there have been for me in my life, you know, and I think it's about finding community and going out and finding those people who will listen to you, who won't fucking treat you that way because they do exist. You know, there's a lot of groups that WGA has a lot of organ like groups for communities to come together. It's just about finding the people who see you as a three-dimensional person and who allow you to get better as an artist and who inspire you. And I hope that you find that community and please reach out to us. And, you know, I'm just so sorry you're going through that. Yeah. And I can hear the perseverance and even the way the question was framed and like, and, you know, how you were expressing your, your experience, like just keep going, keep creating. Not yet. Community, 100%. I feel invisible all the time. <laughs> and I think a lot of us do in this industry. It's not an easy life and decision we've made to be in this industry. And truly just like finding other writers and other people and friendships. Uh, if you're part of the WJ, there's a WJ Middle Eastern Committee, if that's something that you're interested in joining. And we just had our first in-person meeting, which is incredible. Just see other people in the community, but also I'm part of like a writer's group. And it's just been incredible to have other people who also feel the same way and also feel invisible. So you realize you're not alone in this feeling and encouraging each other and 100%. It's I think communities is a strong answer. Yeah. 
community is the answer. Uh, and with that, we are out of time, although I could keep talking to you all for much longer. I want to sincerely thank you all, Bernardo, Mike, Mujan, for being here and for being our, um, just incredible and so open. Also, the WGA Foundation, Storyline Partners. Um, Y'all have been incredible. And just thank you for this. It's been incredible talking to you all. Thank you all for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.